Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Armourer's Bench. Today we're taking a very special look at an original Ferguson rifle. This is a military pattern Ferguson, uh, one of the original Der's Egg production guns. And we're going to take a close up look at this and see how the action works, and then we'll discuss some of the history behind the gun. Patrick Ferguson's rifle is one of the most interesting and arguably successful early attempts at a breech loading service rifle. Coupling a surprisingly robust screw breech plug with rifling, Ferguson's rifle was said to be capable of a remarkable 7 rounds per minute. In an age when 3 or 4 rounds a minute was considered impressive, the Ferguson's ability to fire as many as 6 aim shots in a minute was tactically groundbreaking. The rifle was what we would today describe as a force multiplier. Ferguson's gun has the distinction of being the first breech loading rifle adopted for service and used by the British Army in action. I don't want to go into too much detail about Ferguson's life and recommend checking out our detailed blog on Ferguson that I've written to accompany this episode. But it's worth discussing his career both before and after the development of his rifle to learn a little about the man behind the weapon. Ferguson was part of a generation of active, intelligent, professional and ambitious British Light Infantry officers. The Light Infantry arm of the 18th century British Army was arguably one of the most able elements of its day. Ferguson was reputedly one of the army's finest marksmen, and by the time he arrived in North America he was well versed in the light infantry tactics of the day, including skirmishing, scouting, and irregular warfare. Born in Aberdeenshire in Scotland in 1744, Ferguson joined the Scots Greys as a cornet at the age of 15. He must have been an intelligent young man as he spent two years at the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich, a school which specialised in the training of artillery and engineering officers. He first saw action during the Seven Years' War in Europe. In 1768, at the age of 24, Ferguson sold his cornetcy and bought a captaincy in the 70th Regiment of Foot and served in the Caribbean for several years. In 1771, the British Army introduced dedicated light infantry companies to each infantry battalion, and Captain Ferguson was given command of the 70th Foot's Light Infantry Company. At this point, however, the British Army's light infantry arm was merely light in name, with little specialist training given. In 1774, however, Ferguson and his company spent the summer at the Light Infantry Training Camp established by General Sir William Howe, learning how to deploy and fight as skirmishers. Further lessons would be quickly learned, however, when the British found themselves fighting in North America, just a year later. It's believed that it was around this time that Ferguson began developing his rifle. He commissioned Derzeg, the renowned Anglo-Swiss gunmaker, to produce an improved version of Isaac de la Chalmette's screw plug breech loading action. Chalmette had originally patented his design in the early 1700s. Ferguson took Chalmette's design and sought to improve it and make a weapon that could withstand service use. He made a number of improvements to the earlier design, principally by introducing a multi start perpendicular screw breech plug with 10 threads at one thread per inch. This meant that the breach could be opened by completing just one full revolution of the trigger guard. Ferguson began lobbying senior officers, writing to Lord Townsend, the Master General of Ordnance, telling him that his rifle fired, with twice the expedition and five times the certainty, is five pounds lighter and requires only a fourth part of the powder of a common firelock. British encounters with American riflemen drove interest in the adoption of rifles and eventually, the Board of Ordnance took notice of Ferguson's rifle. Following a successful initial trial, he was allowed to demonstrate his gun before senior officers in April 1776. In the early hours of Saturday the 1st of June 1776, Ferguson was advised that Lord Townsend, along with senior artillery and ordnance officers, wished him to demonstrate his rifle at Woolwich later that morning. It was a wet and windy morning, but Ferguson put on a display of shooting, which is still widely regarded as an impressive feat. Here we can see a contemporary account of the demonstration that was published in the 1776 edition of the Annual Register. It describes how Ferguson first fired four or five rounds at a target 200 yards away in just a minute. He then demonstrated the speed of his action, firing six shots in a minute, before firing four rounds a minute while walking at a brisk walking pace. He then demonstrated his rifle's accuracy by putting a round in the bull at 100 yards while lying on his back. All reportedly accomplished while missing just three shots. 
The demonstration had a dramatic effect. Lord Townsend directed Ferguson to oversee the production of a hundred of his rifles for further testing. Four Birmingham gunmakers were contracted by the Board of Ordnance to produce 25 rifles each. These companies were William Grice, Benjamin Willits, Matthias Barker and Samuel Galton and Son. The rifles were produced at a cost of £4 each, roughly double the cost of a short land pattern brown best musket then in service. Ferguson patented his breech screw plug action in December 1776. Here we can see the original pattern drawings. They show his threaded breech plug and an alternative sliding block action, as well as a design for four groove rifling. Ferguson was authorised to raise an experimental corps of riflemen to test his rifle in the field. Initially intended to comprise up to 200 men forming two companies, but it was later reduced to 100. In early 1777, Ferguson began forming and training his corps at Chatham. The men of the experimental unit were drawn from the 6th and 14th regiments of foot, but Ferguson wasn't too enthusiastic about his recruits, describing them as, not in any respects to my wish. Ferguson was seconded from the 70th foot and officially given command of his corps on the 6th of March, 1777. The Experimental Rifle Corps was to sail to America and join General Sir William Howe's imminent campaign to take Philadelphia. The corps was only authorised for one campaign, after which Ferguson and his men would have to return to their parent units, unless the experiment was deemed a success. Ferguson and his men arrived in America on the 23rd of May, his experimental force, which in his own words never exceeded 90 men under arms, fought in a number of engagements during the Philadelphia campaign, the largest being the Battle of Brandywine Creek in September. During the battle, Ferguson and his company were attached to General Wilhelm von Niffhausen's column, who was tasked with the diversionary attack to fix George Washington's army in place, while General Sir William Howe's main force flanked the American position. Ferguson and his men found themselves in some hot fighting at the head of the column. Alongside Loyalist Light Infantry Battalion, the Queen's Rangers, Ferguson's riflemen pushed back the American Light Infantry under Brigadier General William Maxwell. Famously, or perhaps infamously, Ferguson and a party of his riflemen are supposed to have encountered George Washington during the battle. In a letter home, Ferguson wrote that he'd been forward near the American line when he saw a rebel officer, remarkable by his address, passed towards our army within a hundred yards, not perceiving us. He was followed by another, dressed in dark green on blue, mounted on a very good bay horse with a remarkable large high-cocked hat. Ferguson initially ordered three of his men forward to open fire on the officers, but thought better of it, feeling it an ungentlemanly act. Instead, he moved forward himself and called on the hussar to surrender but the two men rode away, and Ferguson chose not to shoot them in the back. He was told later while in hospital that the two men were likely General Washington and a Polish cavalry officer, General Kazimierz Pulaski. While the story can't be proven with any degree of certainty, and recent academic research casts doubt on the second man being Washington, it's certainly a call for anecdote. The heavy casualties suffered by Ferguson's corps are often described as one of the key reasons for its disbandment. However, Ferguson's corps reportedly lost just two men and six wounded, including Ferguson himself. In a letter home to his brother George, Ferguson attributed this relatively low casualty rate to his men being able to load and fire from cover. Shortly after his encounter with the Hussar, a musket ball shattered Ferguson's right elbow. It took him a year to recuperate, suffering numerous painful surgeries. In the meantime, with well-trained light infantry in short supply, Ferguson's experimental corps was disbanded. His men were returned to their original units, and while some sources suggest their rifles were placed in store, research shows that the men probably took their kit with them. Javier Delagata's painting of the Battle of Paoli, which took place a week after Brandywine, shows what is believed to be some of Ferguson's men in their green jackets, with their long sword bayonets fixed. DeWitt Bailey also notes that a February 1778 entry into an orderly book for the Guards Brigade, calls for an inventory of all remaining Ferguson rifles still in use with various battalions. If it was the case that the men took their rifles back to their parent battalions, then attrition of the remaining guns from use in the field partially explains why so few survive today. 
In July 1778, the Ordnance Office ordered the return of all remaining Ferguson rifles still in use, probably for repair and storage. In late 1778, recovered but with a largely lame right arm, Ferguson returned to the field, leading a number of scouting expeditions and raids on American bases in New Jersey. He was subsequently made Brevet Lieutenant Colonel and appointed Commanding Officer of the Loyal American Volunteers, before becoming Inspector of Militia in the Carolinas. During 1779 and 1780, Ferguson led his Loyalist militia forces in the Carolinas, but in October 1780, he was killed in South Carolina during the Battle of Kings Mountain. Now that we've discussed the man, let's examine his rifle in more detail. Today we're examining a Durs Egg built military pattern Ferguson, but while similar, it's not one of the original 100 Board of Ordnance rifles. There is a great deal of variation amongst the few surviving Ferguson rifles in terms of both aesthetic differences, such as wood or steel ramrods, or the type of rear sight, but also more fundamental differences, such as the potential use of bronze breech plugs, the number of threads used, and the presence and positioning of fouling grooves. This is the result of not just 18th century manufacturing processes, but also due to the choices made by individual gunmakers as well as evolution of the design itself. Typically, the surviving rifles have a number of common features, including the multi-start breech plug, trigger guard lever, the presence of one or two unusual patterns of rear sight, and a bayonet lug beneath the barrel. There is some slight variation in the barrel length and bore diameters, but the style of lock seen on the rifles is fairly uniform. This rifle has an iron breech plug with a 10-start thread. This allows it to open the breech with just one turn. Surviving examples of the Board of Ordnance rifles appear to all have 11 start threads. We can see how many threads a plug has by looking at its outline. Each point here represents a thread. The markings on the rifles vary in terms of manufacture. The guns made for the Board of Ordnance have the maker's stamps on the barrel and various proof markings and serial numbered parts while the locks are marked Tower and GR. The non-Board of Ordnance guns, like this one, have commercial style gun makers marks on both the lock and the barrel. Most of the surviving military pattern rifles have wooden rather than steel ramrods. Our example, however, has a steel ramrod. There is some slight variation in the brass pipes which hold the ramrods, and some differences in the position and width of the brass nose cap. The ramrod could be used to muzzle load the rifle if the screw plug became jammed or so fouled it could not be opened. Provided the plug was in place, the rifle could still be loaded from the muzzle, but without its plug, the rifle became useless. The surviving military Fergusons have two patterns of rear sight. The board of ordnance guns have a rear notch post sighted at 200 yards and a folding leaf sight with an aperture sighted for 300 yards and a further notch cut above the aperture likely sighted for 350 yards. The other pattern of sight, seen on our rifle, uses a brass rear sight located just behind the breech, in front of the tang, which slides up and down. This sight is seen on two Derzeg made rifles, as well as an example produced by Hunt, dating from 1780, which is held by the National Army Museum. There is also some variation in the style of trigger guard, with most being made of iron, and all appear to be held in the closed position by a similar detent projecting from the rifle's wrist. Here we can see a groove cut into the thread. This acts as an anti-fouling cut. Not all of the surviving Ferguson rifles appear to have the anti-fouling cuts, which are described in Ferguson's 1776 pant. We've already discussed some of the improvements that Ferguson made to La Chamette's earlier system, but according to Ferguson's patent, the breech plug was designed to be cleaned without having to be fully removed from the rifle. The plug was not retained in the gun by any mechanical means, and if you unscrew it too far, it will come free. The lower section of the plug on some guns was smooth, and allowed the fouling to be pushed out of the threads as the action was worked. Additionally, according to his patent, the threads cut into the plug directed fouling away from the breech and were intended to spread powder gases evenly. A hollow or reservoir behind the plug also aims to help direct fouling out of the action. 
but not all surviving examples have this. The period correct loading procedure for the Ferguson is uncertain, as no instructions have survived. The Ferguson used the British Army's standard .615 calibre carbine ball, rather than the full-sized .71 musket ball. Like the 1776 Jaeger pattern rifles, Ferguson's gun is believed to have used the special double-strength or double-glazed rifle powder, which was about six times more expensive to produce than regular issue powder. Riflemen likely carried both paper cartridges, as well as a flask and ball bag. To load, the rifleman would first place the weapon on half cock, and then unscrew the breech. Then, he would place a ball in the breech, where it would be held in place by the narrower bore. He would then pour in the powder behind the ball, from either his flask or the cartridge, before screwing the breech block back into place. He then primed his pan from either his flask, the remains of the cartridge, or he could push excess powder across from the top of the breech into the pan, and then he was ready to fire. The question of how good of a weapon was the Ferguson is often asked, so let's look at some of its advantages and disadvantages. The key advantage of the rifle was its ease of loading. Removing the need to ram the ball down the barrel meant that the rifleman could rapidly load and fire in almost any position, or even while on the move. This enabled him to make the best use of cover, a tactic favoured by the light infantry. At just over 32 inches long, the barrels of the Ferguson rifles made for the Board of Ordnance were 10 inches shorter than the short land pattern Brown Bess that was then in service. It was also substantially lighter, weighing around 7.5 pounds to the musket's 10.5. This made the rifle a handier weapon, one ideal for light infantry. But while the rifle was light, accurate and reliable, it did have several weaknesses. The first of these stemmed from its construction. The rifle's slender, lightweight stocks proved to be somewhat fragile and were prone to cracking at the lock mortise where the wood was thinnest. The rifle we're examining here has recently been restored, but in these photos of two of the surviving rifles believed to have been used by Ferguson's experimental corps, we can see a number of cracks and breaks in their stocks. Whether these occurred during service or in the years afterwards is unknown but the wrists and the wood surrounding the breech and lock appear to be fragile. The rifle held by the Morristown National Historical Park has an iron horseshoe shaped repair beneath its lock which surrounds the breech screw, but it's unclear exactly when this reinforcement was added. While not as robust as a standard issue brown bess, it's important to remember that the first batch of Ferguson rifles were still prototypes, and the design could have been proved upon to strengthen the stock. Another of the Ferguson's disadvantages was its production cost. At £4 per rifle, they were around double the cost of a brown bess, and 17 shillings more expensive than the 1776 Jaeger pattern rifles. The complex design also meant that it could not be produced in the numbers necessary to challenge the dominance of the musket as the average light infantryman's weapon. While only 100 rifles were made for the army, the fate of many of them is unknown. Today a handful of the original Ferguson rifles survive in public and private collections. After Ferguson's death, some of London and Birmingham's finest gunsmiths, including Egg, Henry Nock and Joseph Hunt, made Ferguson pattern rifles in relatively small numbers, for both military and hunting purposes. While some erroneously believe that the rifle was destined to replace the Brown Bess in general service, this is not the case. The Master General of Ordnance had initially directed the focus of rifle production on Ferguson's breech-loading rifle over the muzzle-loading Jaeger pattern. However, if larger scale production had begun, the rifles would only have been destined for light troops, the elite, disciplined, well-trained skirmishers who were best suited to their use. I do not believe that Ferguson intended his rifle to become a standard issue weapon for every soldier. Not only would this have been a massive industrial challenge, in the midst of a war, it would have also been hugely impractical logistically. The Ferguson rifle has the distinction of being the first breech-loading rifle adopted for service by the British Army. Sadly, with so few made, and with the wounding and eventual death of his inventor, the rifle did not have the opportunity to prove itself. It would be another 20 years before the British Army would experiment with another green-coated rifle-armed unit, what would eventually become the 95th Rifles. Thanks for watching guys, hope you enjoyed this look at this very handy, very important early breech loader. It's extremely pointable, very handy, 
relatively light and the action is unbelievably smooth. Thanks again for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. You can also support us over on Patreon and the link for that is in the description box below. Thanks for watching. My special thanks to the collection that holds this rifle for letting us take a look at it. Thanks also to Jonathan Ferguson at the Royal Armouries, Al Muchka, arms curator at the Milwaukee Public Museum, and to Miles Vining for their help researching the Ferguson. Thanks also to Miles for the kind use of some of his photographs. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.